Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for your kind patience and sorry about the wait. Uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna invite uh, our fantastic youth leader, Doris, uh, who's our moderator for today to uh, kindly introduce herself and get the session started. Doris, the floor is yours. Mm, hello, everybody. Unfortunately, I'm unable to um, put my video on because of technical issues, but I'm so happy to see you all of you here and excited for this particular session. My name is Doris Mukali, and I'm an SDG for um, High Level Soaring Coding team member. Um, and yeah, excited to share this particular session and looking forward to hearing all your great insights. So um, do we have Menti on so we can start because we're running late? Fantastic. I can see that Menti is on and you can see how you put at menti.com and use the code that is on the screen. Um, next slide, please. And you can also use the uh, QR, the code over there to just log in with your phone. So the first question is, what are the top three technologies? What are the top three technologies you spend your most time on? So it would be great if you could share your responses there. I can see four people online sharing their responses. Use the code to just log in directly, or you can just go at menti.com and use the code on the screen for you to share your responses with us. I can see that social media apps, websites, social media apps. Hmm. Waiting for more responses. Google, WhatsApp, email, great. Internet, social media apps, WhatsApp. I mean, there are no, there's nobody who uses TikTok. Instagram, Twitter, or X, now it's called X. Oh, I can see Instagram, finally. Website, WhatsApp, great. I can see Caleb has shared his responses on the chat. Uh, yeah. And he says he uses WhatsApp, TikTok, Google, Workspace, and Twitter. Okay. Somebody else has used uses data analysis, uh, stimulation, and chat GPT engineer here. Okay, definitely, very telling. As people put on more responses for this particular question, I think it would also like move on to the next question so that people can still be working on both questions. And our next question is, what stage of, tech, of the technology life cycle do you consider to be the most impactful to the environment? Oh, great. That's a very interesting question. Looking for your insight. So we have seven people and we have four choices for you to make. Maturity, invention, growth, and decline.
and you're using the same Mentimeter, um, you either join at mentimeter.com and use the code, or you can use the code uh, on the screen to join and share your answers with us. Uh, and I'm so sorry that my video is not on, but I'm very enthusiastic about these questions and your answers. Very excited. So do we have any responses or is it like a voting? So I think uh, we could still keep the Mentimeter on and you can feel free to share your insights as we continue with the conversation and, the, and this particular session. And you can always circle back to see some of the interesting um, insights that you have shared with us on Mentimeter. So keep the Mentimeter link on uh, with you and also use the, care, uh, the code if you have any insights that you want to share during the conversation. So we're gonna move to the next part of this particular session because we are running a bit behind time. And the second the second part of this particular conversation will be the keynote from um, Pedro. Uh, so I'm just gonna stop here and let that second part of the session um, take on. So just give us a few minutes as we connect the video. Guests, partners, and participants. First of all, thank the internet whoever for for letting us host this workshop like our partner. And the Digital Policy Lab at the University of Melbourne, in Australia, which I like to thank all the participants that are joining us. Thank you for supporting the amongst you today to share some thoughts Echo friendly. and the critical role of dear guests, partners, and participants. First of all, allow me to thank the Internet Governance Forum for letting us host this workshop alongside our partner ITU and the Digital Policy Lab at the University of Melbourne in Australia, which I would also like to extend my gratitude to. And of course, all the participants that are joining us, thank you for supporting this event. It is really my pleasure to be here amongst you today to share some thoughts and ideas on the importance of promoting eco-friendly emerging technologies and the critical role of higher education in supporting so. I don't need to stress that technology is advancing at an unprecedented pace at the present moment. We have witnessed the rise of technologies such as ChatGPT 
on which our institute has widely published. Artificial intelligence, same, we've just uh, released a publication uh, on the impact of artificial intelligence in higher education, blockchain, deep learning, and so on. To be incipient initiatives to take a prominent role in society, and we can expect for them to continue to do this in the foreseeable future. The 4.0 world is upon us. We believe this to be a positive sign as innovation continues to express itself in new tools that undoubtedly can help us in the future. Nonetheless, we do not believe this innovation must come at the cost of our planet. Therefore, higher education has the obligation to guide the bright minds of the future, not to only be environmental conscious, but to also push beyond and try to be regenerative, as we must not only preserve what we have, but also reclaim spaces that have been lost in our fight against climate change. For this very reason, we have identified some key areas of focus for, as we say, greening higher education to achieve this vision in this coming future. First of all, fostering a global consciousness. We must keep trying to allocate values such as global citizenship, ecological awareness, empathy and resilience to highlight our interconnectedness and the importance of our shared world. This set of values must permeate the whole educational journey of the individual and the group. Second, seek new partnerships. Higher education has to try to seek a new model of partnerships. Governments, private sector, higher education institutions, and of course, uh, a wide range of stakeholders need to come together and create innovation clusters, not only centered on research and development, but also focused on training of education professionals and on bridging the gap to access to technological knowledge and resources to rethink them and create better solutions for our planet. And last but not least, probably the most important contribution of higher education is the push for new policies. Innovation is not exclusive to technology, and our policymakers have to look for new ways to respond to the demands and problems that will appear due to the velocity in which new technologies are emerging and their impact on our societies and our citizens. Policy must be prepared for these new realities and not be fall behind them. I would like to finalize these short opening remarks by highlighting the theme of this 18th IGF, empowering all people. If we look at the far-reaching capacity that young people, women, and many underrepresented groups can play in the process of educating, creating, implementing, and using eco-friendly technologies, we know that we should move from the mentality of leaving no one behind to letting everyone take in the pilot seat. It is time for everyone to be a main driver of a sustainable future and to join efforts to explore the foundation for eco-friendly technologies to be just, accessible and ethical. You can count on uh, UNESCO ESALC in our commitment in greening higher education to support so. I wish you all a great workshop to start this exploration. Sincere thanks for your attention. Uh, such an, a great start to our, our session today. And to build on that, now we'll be moving to the next part of the session by presentations on um, presentations on current work on emerging technologies and environmental efficiency. So um, we're going to move back to that uh, particular session to ensure that we build on a good foundation before we have our panelists joining in and sharing their insights about this very important topic. So I'm going to give the first presenter the flow. And yeah, looking forward to a very interesting presentation and very interesting discussion from all of you. Thank you.
Uh, the first presentation will be from Lily, who is sharing her screen currently with very nice looking slides. Thank you so much, Doris, and uh, thank you so much to uh, Francesc in highlighting, you know, the importance of uh, greening initiatives uh, through the role of uh, higher education and beyond. I mean, higher education is really the bridge that connects not only to other levels of education through, for example, um, uh, Teacher Training Institute in embedding the greening and environmental concept into education system, but more importantly, the bridge from knowledge to practices in the actual field to the industry, specifically to what we're talking about today, to innovative industries. Uh, with that being said, the foundation of any other greening process start with where innovation happens. And with that being said, it's my great honor today to share with everyone uh, an ITU technical report that we published uh, in 2021 within the framework of RTV Official Intelligence for Environmental Efficiency Project. Um, uh, the, the technical report uh, it's a global guideline on implementation of eco-friendly criteria for AI and uh, other emerging technologies. And uh, it's also my honor today to be here with two of the co-authors of this global guideline, uh, Professor Ingrid Walkmer and Professor Yunjin Wang, to provide further insight on what is actually being covered and what we hope to achieve in the area of emerging technology and environmental efficiency. Uh, if I may uh, start, I would like to first present very quickly about the goal of the report is really the focus on SDG 13, and it's important to find some commonalities within the field of the industries and to involve different stakeholders to um, work towards the common goal on finding a middle ground, balancing the interests to a place where everyone should be somewhat comfortable understanding uh, that little compromises in uh, their practices can contribute greatly to SDG 13. And uh, uh, the scope of this uh, ITU AI for Environmental uh, Efficiency project is a very global project. It covers all five different regions of the UN. And um, uh, the time frame overall uh, for this project was from uh, me 2020 all the way until 2022 December, uh, with this particular pro uh, report being produced from November to September with uh, some consultation activities and expert brainstorming and working um, involving stakeholders from different, um, you know, industries uh, in finding what are some of the dimensions that should be touched upon. Um, and uh, the framework of the report starts with having very basic yet necessary information identifying what it actually means by AI and what it means by emerging technology and actually finding the link uh, between those identified technologies to environmental efficiency factors through an adjusted model of uh, life cycle assessment of product with three main stages of environmental impact. And uh, upon uh, you know, knowledge based on technology and the knowledge on life cycle assessment, we further provided both long-term and short-term strategies uh, in responding, or I would say calling for policymakers and po calling for industry leaders and calling for just general you know, citizens in participating in the process of uh, greening innovation uh, towards the greater benefit of uh, SDG 13 with um, the consideration of what works at individual level and local level to serve the best. Um, with that being said, if, if I may share briefly on um, the very key identification of AI and emerging technology, uh, we would say that how the, the way we defined it is uh, that you know emerging technology is a really broad term. Uh, it covers, you know, some of the, the very trendy like AI, like ChatGPT, like drone, 3D printing, this and that. At the same time, it also uh, it leaves room for different countries, different institutions and different communities to identify what are the most common 
widely uh, applied technology at that moment. So for others, there may be blockchain, for some other, there may be big data uh, to give a room on the technologies to, uh, let's say, to be identified uh, in understanding their specific applications in the 16 domains. And uh, the 16 domains have very high relevancy to the SDG overall, with some specific focus on education, health industry, uh, sorry, infrastructure, uh, and energy. And uh, upon that process of identifying emerging technology and what it actually means, the process on linking AI and other uh, emerging technology with environmental efficiency started. As you can see, the very traditional model of life cycle assessment, what you're seeing on the left, involves five different stages. Uh, well, when we conducted uh, the, 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 uh, this knowledge at ITU, we decided to actually simplify it to three main stages, which include materia, uh, usage, and end of life. And materia is basically anything that comes within you know, raw material extraction, design, manufacturing, and when it moves to usage, the responsibility is not only on the, you know, the private sector that actually implemented or designed it, but also on the individuals who have those very uh, daily interactions with them on understanding the operation, the consumption, the maintenance, the repair that people can actually relate to uh, as you know, the first minty uh, uh, question uh, address. And then the third uh, stage is end of life, which include uh, deconstruction, transport, waterways, disposal, recycling. And uh, in recycling, there's more than just, uh, uh, you know, tossing into a bean that someone will, 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 you know, take care of it whatsoever. It actually highly refers to reuse, recovery, recycling and remanufacturing, which some of our expert uh, respondents will be addressing maybe later on. And uh, now, uh, without going really further into uh, all the technology that are six domains, I would like to share very briefly to end this presentation on the guidelines and recommendation we provided. Uh, the first one, very importantly, is it's, we need to have an evidence-based approach. So having data collection strategy before implementing any kinds of recommendation at policy level, at private sector level, at uh, even individual level is very important to actually address local needs and, and, and ensure you know, uh, that decision-making is based on the evidence. And second, uh, it's, it's, we recommended actions to be implemented at all three environmental stages for major emerging technologies. And third, uh, if in, in terms of possible actions, it's not just from a technological perspective or an environmental perspective, but rather a techno environmental perspective, blending in this mentality from the very beginning of designing this technology. And uh, fourth, uh, the guideline includes some very general recommendations for different stakeholders working in different industries to relate to AI and other emerging technologies. Uh, so uh, to respond to the evidence-based approach, we have designed uh, several instruments, um, uh, specifically three generic survey templates targeting different group of people in understanding where they stand and where they, where they should go moving forward with this eco-friendly emerging uh, the technology. So for the general citizens, who's all related in some way to technology, there are seven questions. And in order to get more or less a valid uh, a response, we would hope to have around 500 to 1,000 citizens. And information to be collected include their awareness, their perception, uh, their known practices to actually enable climate neutral technology use, and the different levels of knowledge among citizens regarding environmental uh, pollution and health in relation to such environmental pollution. And the second set of survey is targeting policymakers specifically. And uh, if we're looking at the global scope, once again, it will be you know, around 100 to 500 policymakers with 10 specific questions, understanding the existing policy. It's where it stands now in terms of the, its implementation, including both the actual practices as well as the risk and challenges. Uh, the effectiveness of current policy and what are some forcing and policy areas that can be useful to address those current concerns. And the third one specifically target the private sector, the industry that are highly in charge of uh, 
you know, delivering those technology uh, to respond to national uh, development plans as well as to individuals. And there are about 11 questions and uh, the same, we're aiming at the same number of executives and uh, hoping that the information can reflect, you know, some of the proactive sustainable uh, measurements, some of the new climate friendly technologies that they're inventing or in or under design uh, and some of the sustainable energy solution in implementation, as well as their current strategy to minimize waste, either that's their own choice or is enforced by their uh, state or by their country. So with all those, we're hoping eventually following this global guideline that we'll, we will uh, have a, some somewhat an idea of where a country or where a community stands in terms of moving forward with creating eco-friendly um, technology policies and also eco-friendly policy system to further incentivize the greening technology process, um, which a lot of those information eventually can be retrieved back to education because you know the earlier our, our kids can start in understanding those awareness and those concepts, the design, the better that they can have those awareness uh, into their, their actions, either at individual, institutional, or national level, into their future. Uh, I wouldn't go really uh, into the, the contextualization uh, part. I know we are short on time, but the whole idea is for the general survey is really targeting all the relevant stakeholders. Well, some of the contextualized questions, depending on which country uh, or community we're targeting in, it's very important to first identify the emerging technology in that particular context and the environmental responses uh, towards it. Um, let's see. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, there are some sample recommendations uh, and on, on, oh, sorry, there are some uh, sample Whoops. Okay, there are some sample recommendations on uh, AI. So, um, and there are some uh, sample actions for different applications. So we ba when we drafted the report, we basically divided that for certain technologies, we have recommendations for the three stages, material use and end of life. And for some of the very generic ones that touch upon or cut across different emerging technologies, we had some key uh, themes, for example, consumption, for example, recycling. Uh, I wouldn't go into details. Uh, I will share the link of uh, the, the global guideline. So if uh, you want to read it later, uh, there will be more information on it. And uh, in terms of the very general recommendation for stakeholders, we have divided it into development, deployment, business and market regulations, policy and standard, which also cut across the different process um, of, uh, of uh, technology. And uh, we, we, we try as much as we can not to provide too many recommendations to be overwhelming, uh, but somewhere to start with, for example, for regulations, policies, and standards, echoing back to what Frances just mentioned, a multi-stakeholder engagement and engaging in uh, you know, new uh, partnership models can, can support with this process of, uh, you know, greening. Um, of, of greening innovation and uh, for um, for business and market, you know, a lot of innovation, although they, they, they're just really emerging and pop up really fast, go away really fast, it's important to have those ultra long-term financing and investment strategies to support with the greening process and also as an incentive. Mm. With that being said, I will end right here and I would give the floor to uh, Ingrid to actually uh, uh, discuss some of the, the initiatives and the actions that have been uh, taken place upon conclusion uh, of this uh, guideline, but a new start for action. So Ingrid, the, the floor is yours. Could you bring up my slides, please? Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is Ingrid Volkma. I'm a um, professor at the University of Melbourne. I'm also directing um, a digital policy lab at the University of Melbourne and it, this is one of our projects. Um, what I want to talk about today is in a way a glimpse into our research. This is a, a, pro a project that's currently being undertaken and we are looking at the very different approaches to AI policy across countries, across the global north and the global south. And the reason is that, as you know, AI 
is a globalized technology. It will be a game changer in many ways. Um, and that is why we feel um, new policy approaches are needed, especially when thinking about AI, environment, uh, reduction of emissions, carbon neutrality, etc. While AI is often uh, portrayed as being not very energy intensive, the context, the technological context, the ecosystems around AI are um, uh, not carbon neutra neutral and they are producing a lot of emissions. So it is really important to take a full look at this new picture and this uh, new reality we are seeing and think about in a creative way perhaps about policy frameworks around uh, environment, um, carbon neutrality in a new AI world. So far, we basically talk about generative AI and the implications on education, the implications on uh, po po politics, the implications on journalism, uh, but AI and specifically generative AI <coughs> will be uh, also a game changer in uh, creating new technologies, creating new ecosystems, so that is another reason why digital policy around environment and climate in context of AI is specifically needed. And I now go to my <coughs> first slide. So um, in this study, uh, we are looking, uh, uh, as I said, across the world, and what I can do here is only portray a few of these um, insights. So what is really interesting is that um, AI policies or AI strategies by governments or nations started <coughs> excuse me, in 2017, but in very different ways. While AI, and as we see uh, also other technology monopolies operate uh, around the world and create monopolies and create globalized um, uh, ecosystems, policies are still uh, national, territorial, uh, looking at um, national um, practices. So the first generation national strategies around AI were basically around the definition of national regulatory motives and themes of AI. And just some examples, in China in 2017, AI uh, development plan was created. AI was seen as a driver of the industry, education skills, standard setting, ethical norms and security to become a world leading AI tech a country in 2025 and so on. Similar in Singapore, similar in Canada, but again, very nuanced differences we see here in United Arab Emirates. AI policies um, meant to be de developing skill sets of workforces, integrate AI into medical security services and so on. Um, but there are also uh, countries in the Global South that already in 2017-18 started to look at AI as a policy, uh, it's through a policy strategy. So in Mexico, AI was meant to increase the competitiveness of companies and inclusion, uh, driving the data uh, and digital infrastructure, cyber, uh, um, supporting cyber security, ethics, research, and so on. In India, in 2018, national AI strategy was meant to support healthcare, ag agriculture, etc. Nobody talked about environment around AI at that time, which of course had to do with the um, technology status of AI at the time. A second generation AI strategy domain, if you like, um, began in 2019, where uh, this focus on enhancing security and protection of human dignity, that is where AI or, where or was already seen um, as um, a, a, a human-centric AI, creating hu diversity, inclusion, sustainability in Japan. In, in Canada, Artificial Intelligence and Data Act was passed uh, to, to manage uh, the risk and the information uh, disclosure around AI systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You see this on this slide. But then, what was really interesting, there was a shift in 2020, uh, 2022, sorry, um, in in Germany um, when uh, the G7 uh, digital ministers met, and what they were creating was not so much reproducing the sovereignty approach to AI governance or the national approach to AI governance in an intergovernmental way, what we also see at the OECD or UNESCO and others, but what they uh, started saying is that we are now living in a reality of international data spaces and that was, in my view, a real big shift away from this paradigm of the sovereign 
territorial regulation of um, uh, AI and other technologies or intergovernmental regulations. Now we are looking at, uh, um, according to the G7 digital ministers, into an international data space. And I feel this was a real, or is a paradigm shift that we need to take on board more. What they say is, uh, in dialogue with stakeholders uh, from the private sector, civil society and academia, we will seek ways to better harness digital technologies for a net zero, nature positive and resource effective economy and digital ecosystem, recognizing the importance of more holistic measurement of all impacts of digitalization on the environment and climate, so to increase energy and resource efficiency in the use of digital technologies and services such, such as data centers and telecommunication networks and this is one of the most uh, coherent um, list of all sorts of environmental uh, issues that need to be addressed in um, AI policies, but they have been brought up through this perspective of international data spaces. We normally, in digital policy frameworks, don't talk about international data spaces. This is the first time, and I, this is a really important shift in these debates. And I would argue that this, this shift needs now to be taken on to meet the challenges of the future. So it is this uh, holistic uh, data space, international data spaces, but we also need to look at a holistic planetary environment in context of AI and environment policy. So it's no longer um, you know, global north, global south being divided by um, environmental uh, policies, but we need to look at both global south and north in Nigeria the e-waste from the U.S. is being burned, uh, being sent from the U.S. to Nigeria, being burned, and all these the smoke and all these fumes, etc., go come up, uh, go up in, into the air and into the um, atmosphere for all of us. So we can't just uh, look at this in a sovereign space anymore. And this idea of the digital um, of the data spaces is really a very good approach for policy frameworks perhaps to also link this much, much closer to a holistic perspective of implications on a planetary, interconnected, interdependent environment. And that is really uh, important. So it could also address the growing magnitude of an interrelated international data space and its implications on the planetary environments, which is not possible in the frameworks we have today. What we are seeing today is really a fragmentation of um, policy debates of around AI and environment. So there are intergovernmental organizations that address specific growth sectors, for example, uh, OECD. There are others who um, uh, measure, uh, look at carbon footprints, etc. But these are all interconnected or disconnected, rather, uh, debates, fragmented debates, and we need a holistic approach to this as well. Um, furthermore, uh, data spaces should also look at households and it's not sufficient. Uh, the, the metrics we are having which are looking at uh, predictions of uh, the future developments of, um, of certain technologies, of drones, of mobile phones, of all these other devices. But as we heard in the earlier speech by uh, Lily uh, Liu, we need to look at this holistic uh, technological environment and, and um, ecosystem as well here. And we need to look at the global north and south at the same time. So this idea of international data spaces, a holistic planetary perspective, I think is needed to solve the problems we are having today. And also, uh, just a final note on this, uh, yes, data centers, we know that uh, Google, um, Facebook, and uh, Meta, etc. They are uh, aiming to reach carbon neutrality through different means, through carbon um, offsets or through solar, uh, using solar power. But there are numerous other data centers, smaller data centers, which are not uh, operating along those lines. And those are, uh, this data center uh, issue needs to be addressed as well on a global scale and not just a, uh, a, a national scale. Um, and just to show you some of the, um, the issues uh, countries of the Global South have in this space, here is some examples from Nigeria. Nigeria is um, uh, 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 aware of, of the importance of AI, its benefit to the economy. They are producing um, all sorts of um, national centers for AI robotics, but in terms of energy, AI has been considered as a major way of enhancing renewables. 
um, but at the same time the, the country um, has uh, massive electricity problems. So these are really these imbalances we are seeing if we are looking across global north and global south in a planetary perspective and then we can interpret these sorts of policy frameworks in a perhaps new way. This is an example from Argentina. I will uh, just skip this, but it's, it's similar. It's, it it re reflects the specific country perspectives and the, the imbalances within a country and also the relation of um, energy and data uh, centers to the national energy grids, which are often, uh, like in the case of Argentina, fossil uh, fueled and with only 12% of energy consumption coming from renewable sources in the national energy grid. So these are also issues that have to be uh, addressed and similar in India there are also um, these imbalances on a national scale but I think it's time to produce a, a global map perhaps of these uh, national perceptions of um, planetary holistic uh, AI uh, climate issues and policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid and Lily, for your great presentations. Now to further discuss the presentations made by Lily and Ingrid, we're gonna have a discussion, a 10 minutes discussion where we're gonna have respondents. We're gonna be uh, giving us insights in terms of what are their insights on these presentations made by both Lily and Ingrid on artificial intelligence. So our first respondent will be um, Ola. Uh, if Ola would take the mic and give us you know, just some of the reactions that she has from these particular presentations in terms of the recommendations and in terms of the foundation that it sets for this particular session. So Ola, the floor is yours and looking forward to hearing your reactions on these two amazing presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Very well. Thank you very much um, for the two presentations. I'm going to be talking from the private sector perspective. I have my background in financial and risk management within the energy sector, and I have been interested in energy transition and sustainability and um, all the emerging innovations that would hopefully get us to net zero someday soon. So I'm with regards to the two presentations that um, we've listened to today, I'm going to be looking at um, you know, the pros and cons of AI and emerging technology um, from a private sector perspective. Um, we all know, like you've said in the presentation that AI and other emerging technologies have come to disrupt the way we have worked in um, the way companies have worked. And um, especially with the need to get to net zero, companies have been looking for different innovative ways to you know, develop their clean, um, clean energy strategy. And it has therefore redefined the way the different organizations work. Um, innovate, the innovation has driven clean technology and renewable energy companies have been able to use a lot of data which they have been able to garner together from using AI to make decisions and to um, meet their strategies. And also the Emerging technologies and AI has also helped with helping with pain points, the customer experiences. So the companies have used the pain points to create new and value adding business models that is leading to customer satisfaction today. And that has helped them with profitability and also meeting their um, Net, net zero strategy. One very important area that we need to emphasize is also the fact that investors have been very interested in what um, companies are doing with their money 
and how it affects the environment. And there has been quite a few um, reporting guidelines that have come out. Companies are now required to report on the environmental impact of their activities. And um, with the use of AI and emerging technologies, companies have had to state what the impact is. And with that requirement, they're therefore um, obliged to make sure that any negative externalities to the environment is quickly curbed. And um, investors have been asking a lot of questions on the impact of the company's activity on the, on the environment. Just in September, the tax, for, the tax force on nature and um, biodiversity decided that companies have to, now, um, have to now report on the impact of their activities on nature and biodiversity. Again, with the use of AI and other emerging technologies, company can, company find, companies will now find it easier to capture those issues and to do something about those issues quickly before those impacts, those negative externalities, before they get out of, before they get out of hand. These emerging technologies also have helped with job creation because there have been quite a number of startups that have been created in the area of AI and you know, a lot of um, other technologies that were mentioned earlier. And this has boost income and also GDP. What the AI and other technologies have also done is to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there has been talent creation and retention. What we know is that AI will continue to improve and AI companies will continue to also embrace the circular economy. So materials will be reused. Um, there'll be recycling of machines. And um, we hope that this would um, create sustainable companies in the future. There's still some disadvantages today with the emerging technologies. There very energy intensive, like was mentioned earlier. Um, the different data centers do use a lot of technologies. So we expect that government regulations would come in to, government will come in to regulate the, these, these um, data centers. And we also understand that there's been quite a bit of greenwashing, you know, where companies may, may state what they're doing with um, um, copying the environmental impact, but that is not, um, that hasn't really been, that hasn't really been effective. So we believe that government regulations will come in to help with that. Um, also, in terms of the incentives, we, again, government policy should be an incentive there should be support from financial institutions and funding agencies to, to help with the development of this technology and um, the ability to control the environmental impact. Um, we saw from the African Climate Summit that just concluded in Nairobi, quite a number of funding institutions have um, committed quite um, substantial funds to help the countries to get to net zero. Substantial amount of, substantial part of that, those funds will be spent on developing technologies that will help them to get to net zero. Um, we believe also that the government should create institution, institutional changes that would help with um, data security, data privacy, and data ownership. And governments should also build knowledge, they should build capacity and um, 
understanding. That's that. Those are my comments. Thank you so much, Ola, for your interventions and sharing with us your the perspective you. on our private sector. And I know that we are short on time, so we're going to be moving on to the responses from the other part, the other respondents, and then we're going to have an opportunity from our, an opportunity for our audience to ask questions in terms of this very particular important discussion and hear their reactions about the, both the interventions by our panelists and also the reactions from the two presentations from our presenters was Lily and Ingrid. So the next respondent um, would be um, Abby. And as Abby gives her reactions to the presentation, I'd also just like to ask the question that given the pas her passion on clean energy and green economy at future perspectives, how does she see the role of civil society as she gives her responses to those particular presentations? So if she could just cover those two uh, questions, that would be amazing. So Abby, you have the flow. Thank you so much, Doris, uh, for giving me the floor. Um, I represent Future Perspectives, a, a nonprofit organization that inspires uh, the youth to spearhead you know, in terms of uh, revolution, championing education, reform, and propelling investments in innovation, obviously to solve modern um, issues that we have like climate action or climate change. Um, obviously, we know that in being able to address uh, these pressing challenges um, requires a multifaceted approach. And we believe that um, as advocates for uh, of Africa, our um, organization needs to foster civil societies or nations need to uh, foster a collaborative system that values knowledge sharing. Um, we also believe that uh, the governments, um, businesses, foundations, universities, and other key state design interventions geared at delivering systematic, scalable, and sustainable impact. Um, from our perspective, you know, uh, some of the ways that we've seen uh, that we can help to impact uh, policy at the community level is by having convened uh, spaces to facilitate meaningful and inclusive dialogue, as well as create platforms to spotlight innovations. We believe capacity building and skills enhancements to drive youth leadership and action is really important. Um, obviously also providing um, our youth uh, the opportunity to be able to engage in cutting edge thought leadership on key issues is really important shaping new narratives and in uh shaping new innovators through immersive storytelling uh, again coming from the youth perspective we believe that these are opportunities that uh, civil society and foundations can really help uh, these policies that can support eco-friendly technology um, and also, we believe that the youth, you know, have to be prominently woven into global conversations and that their participation and activism will not only create a profound impact, bring forth the, uh, the not just Africa, but the global world needs. Uh, we know to sit at the table their collective power and also equipping them with the necessary knowledge, skills, and tools. We used obviously to unleash, you know, uh, really great policies and technology and innovation were really, really um, uh, uh, yearns for. Uh, so we believe that the um, civil society and, you know, foundations as a whole, they play a really critical role too as well, you know, from a was as well in ensuring that um, uh, we provide this nonpartisan for uh, people depend no matter uh, uh, you know creed um, and as well as bringing in the marginalized uh, communities as uh, 
Lily had mentioned in her presentation that they're all integrated into those conversations because they're the ones feeling the brunt of the, the issues that are at stake and they're the ones also coming up with the solutions to make sure that they have a seat at the table uh, to help ensure that those um, those solutions that are coming, uh, coming to play are coming from those people who are greatly affected uh, by the current Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby, for sharing your perspectives on the role of civil society and ensuring that we create policies for um, environmental friendly policies. Uh, so we have had like interventions from the private sector. We have had in interventions from the civil society. Now I think it's about time we hear the response from Warren, who is going to be giving the perspective on higher learning, like how, what is the role of educators in ensuring that we are creating an ecosystem or a foundation of creating this particular process. So the floor is yours and looking forward to your insights. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doris. Um, thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm Yongjing, Yongjing Wang. I'm an associate professor with the uh, School of Engineering, the University of Birmingham um, in the UK. Um, I'm not just a um, uh, university academic, I'm also a practicing uh, engineer. I've been involved in national, international innovation and engineering programs, in particular in the area of robots and automation and digital technologies to support circular economy. Um, so I'm more speaking, or perhaps from two perspectives, from my two roles. Um, one will be about from a university's point of view. The second will be about from the technical and technological uh, development uh, point of view. So um, from the um, from the university's point of view, I think if we're looking at the question how how universities can can be deeply involved and and contribute to the eco friendly emerging uh, technologies in the area of AI and other uh, areas. And I think actually many universities are already deeply involved, um, in particular um, in, for example, like here um, in the UK, um, we are uh, being responsible engineers is part of our teaching module, is actually in the core of the teaching. And I know in many other countries, uh, we um, there are similar schemes. So I, I feel uh, I feel that uh, based on, on, on my experience with how to motivate for universities to support eco-friendly development is to have um, both internal and external factors ready um, to create such an environment. Um, for the internal factors, basically we're looking at do we have the right people in the universities and in the um, higher education sector to deliver the eco-friendly, um, to deliver the eco-friendly um, emerging technologies, um, are we as practicing engineers are already responsible engineers? Are we aware of what are happening? Uh, what are considered important to um, to the long-term sustainable development goals? Um, so that that is about the internal factor. Uh, about the external factor, actually, a key. I think I think that is the key difference. Um, for example, I mean, for some um, universities, um, for some engineering degrees or, or technology degrees, um, we are actually bounded by the requirement by professional engineering bodies. So professional engineering bodies can request for um, being responsible and being considerate in, term, in terms of, um, in terms of um, engineering and innovation and AI. Um, and how these technologies can affect uh, our environment. Um, actually, the training um, um, of, of this awareness and, and the training of, um, of uh, being responsible and being reconsiderate is raised by the professional engineer, engineering bodies. And in some countries, they are raised by government. So we, we have that requirement, and that is a key reason for many universities to be active. And another key um, ex external factor is um, for many um, leading universities, 
um, in, in particular those research intensive universities. Um, um, many research directions are, um, um, uh, can be affected by research councils and research funding bodies. And that means how, what is the position of eco-friendly uh, development in those um, research councils, in, in those research funding bodies, and that could affect how deep the university can be involved. So I feel in terms of um, uh, in terms of the uh, what what the what we can do in the future, and um, also after hearing the two presentations, um, I feel actually it is just the beginning. Um, um, it's just the beginning of um, something, and um, and I feel actually the eco friendly um, eco friendly um, development of emerging and AI technologies can be separated into two areas. One is more about the itself, how AI tools, what is the environment efficiency? Uh, what is the environment impact of AI tools and techniques? That would be one area. And the, the other area is how we can use AI tools to achieve circular economy. So these two are very, very two different topics. And we need two different measure, measurement systems for these two topics. And then we can think about how these measurement systems can affect the internal factors and external factors. And that would um, that would um, create a much greater boost to um, to 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 um, the eco development or being responsible in terms of AI development. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your interventions. I think we have had a particularly productive session by the two presentations from Lily and the responses from our respondents. So I'd like to take like this particular opportunity to open the flow to the people that have joined us from around the world to just respond one, either to key insights that they have from the two presentations or any reactions they have from the insights that have been shared from an academic perspective and also a practicing engineer perspective, a private sector perspective, and also the perspective of the role of the civil society. So if anybody has any responses, there's an opportunity to interact or to be part of the session, you could just raise your hand and I'll give you an opportunity either to ask a question or to just share your insights uh, from either your background, your context, or from whatever you're joining us from any part of the world. This is the opportunity to do so. And yeah, the floor is yours. So just raise your hand and I'll be able to give you the opportunity to do so. And it's so unfortunate that you can't see my face, but I'm very eager to see all, all of your responses from the interventions and from the presentations. So please do feel encouraged to do so. You could just raise your hand, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining from, and ask us your question. Or share your insights, either, or both. Thank you so much, Doris. And uh, it's it's so nice to hear from uh, our expert respondents uh, from academia perspective, civil society and private sector on how to not only work on themselves, but really to find a synergy to work together. Uh, if I may add, if, if uh, meanwhile, waiting for questions from our, from our participants, this is really the importance of um, engaging the global south. I mean, a lot of times when we look at the involvement of environmental policies in relation to technology, it's almost by default that we go to the global north where a lot of innovations take place. And, uh, you know, they're the icebreaker into certain industries through innovation. However, the impact is global. It's very, very important that we understand the global sales perspective on where they stand in interpreting such designs, in interpreting such consequences, and in interpreting what kind of benefit and what kind of risks that can bring to their actually very high achieving um, SDG 13 figures. I mean, a very shocking moment uh, throughout my work is when I look at the, the SDG 13 progress uh, comparing with other SDGs. It's almost like 
the Africa area is, is red, uh, meaning is, is you know, less advanced in, in other SDG areas. Well, when it moves to SDG 13, there's a lot of green, which means they're actually really advanced. So when we look at those policies, especially for the Global North participants, is there something that by engaging the Global South stakeholders that we can learn from them, that we have an equal conversation, that we can flip the traditional model of having this uh, you know, shared responsibility and actually involve them in their experiences to protect the environment, in their experiences to use innovation effectively, and in understanding more or less the global demand on where innovation can go and should go for the better good instead of you know, from the material stage where there's a lot of, uh, you know, natural resource uh, involved to the usage stage where, uh, you know, sometimes infrastructure is not even there to the recycling stage where um, sometimes certain places in the world are considered as the trash hub for those electronic devices. Can we rethink this model and to create a more equal world? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Doris, and see if there's any participant who would want to get engaged. Thank you so much, Lily, for sharing your insights with us and just talking about how this all links to the SDG um, uh, 2030 agenda and how we should all have like a collective action towards ensuring that we have more equality and more inclusivity in terms of the power dynamics of having these particular conversations between the Global North and the Global South. So I think that's a very important um, point to have in mind. So once again, I'm extending the opportunity from our audience, not only just to ask questions or to react to the presentations given, but also to share their aspirations in terms of this particular important conversation. So um, as we wait for the audience to raise up their hands and share those interventions, I would like also to give just two minutes to our respondents and also uh, Ingrid, who was part of the people that shared our presentations with us to share any aspirations they have in terms of how we could move forward, any concrete steps on how what happens after this particular session? What is your call to action moving forward in terms of policy creation? Uh, just basically a summary of this session or some of the key insights that you have gotten as part of the session. So we're going to start from Ingrid, and then we're going to move to Abby, and then we're going to go to Wong. As I can see, Ola on the chat has already had to be for an important meeting she had to attend. So unfortunately, we'll not be able to get those insights from Ola, but we're going to have those insights from the rest of the panel. Thank you. We are at the beginning of something new, perhaps, and we have to start thinking fresh in this um, uh, environment. Uh, and that's something uh, that relates to education, as we heard from uh, Lily and others, but that also relates to training of young generations, but that also relates to uh, how we phrase <coughs> and frame digital policies around uh, environment and climate. And I feel that for too long we are so... Um, glued to this idea of the, the sovereign national perspective on regulating digital sites, on regulating social media, on regulating misinformation, as we see governments trying uh, to do today. But these approaches often fail because we are living in a new globalized fluid data world where we need new approaches. And I think to look at the environment <coughs> that clearly shows that um, national territorial approaches have reached their limitations and we might need to think about something like <coughs> digital or eco-sovereignty perhaps, a new idea of sovereignty where it, it's clearly, um, it comes through clearly that we are thinking about a new planetary perspectives and uh, safeguarding uh, the planet and not just countries, global north, global south, but we need to look and develop more models that help us understand such a holistic perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for sharing your insights on the importance of empowering young people through education and the importance of also 
having like um yes young people and doing that through education so i'm going to give the next opportunity to abby to share her two minutes interventions or less on the conclusion of this particular session of key insights thank you abby the floor is yours yeah i No, Abby, you're breaking. We can't hear you clearly. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, I want to agree with Ingrid. You know, um, when you look at it from the uh, young people perspective, you know, it's a very holistic um, world right now where it doesn't matter if you're in Nigeria or you could be in Australia. Um, technology has really um, helped to integrate people uh, together. Um, so I think we need to do the same thing in, in our approach with uh, um, with young people uh, in terms of making sure that, you know, like uh, Ingrid said, it's not a sovereignty divide or a global north or a global south, but seeing how we can integrate everyone together and have a holistic approach as we start to look at, you know, emerging technologies uh, that can support, you know, uh, obviously individual countries, but at the end of the day, really looking at it from a holistic perspective as to how do we support the world and the planet, and then going from that perspective. So um, uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be working at at Future Perspectives is really bringing the young people together uh, from all uh, parts of uh, the world and to see how we can learn from each other and create these that can really um, change you know the trajectory of where we are today thank you thank you so much abby for building on the interventions from ingrid now we're gonna have wang who's gonna be giving the last interventions um on his concluding insights about this particular topic right Th thank you doris thank you everyone um, I, I feel I feel actually the discussion today really highlights the importance of um, engagement um, for for discussion like this. Uh, this needs to happen to um, to a wider group of people and having a wider engagement and to involve key stakeholders and and to to get the stakeholders sitting together, I mean to have the innovators, the policymakers, to industrial partners and industrial players, in particular the air, uh, sector leading um, uh, organizations involved in the discussion, and this would um, this would make um, um, create uh, more aligned information flow. And I think many discussion we have had today, and also um, uh, uh, is not widely um, um, uh, received by some key stakeholders. Uh, in the area. And second is, I agree with uh, Ingrid's uh, point about this um, challenge in uh, regulating um, uh, challenges in, uh, in, in terms of uh, the international data exchange. And that could not be solved um, uh, with just one nation or several nations effort. Uh, but I also want to highlight that the um, this problem is coupled with many national uh, challenges as well for example the the data protection and data regulatory um, um, uh, laws or any policy in many ways can be crossed with um, the IP protection and with export control requirement and in many cases um, the um, uh, the changes to the policy about data would require actually an update to the how we can protect IP uh, uh, intellectual property and how um, the export control um, could be applied to many countries and uh, uh, but but I, I feel that if we step back and look at from a human beings um, histor historical perspective actually um, I feel that um, AI is not as special as we thought um, I think if we look at the uh, technological development in history, pretty much everything, every engineering outcome has positive and negative impacts. 
So all the way from nuclear technology to plastic to um, to even robots and robots and labor. What is the relationship between robots and labor? And don't remember, don't don't forget, robot was created nearly half a century ago. I mean, it started to be used over half a century ago. So already had very good lessons in the past. Then how we can deal with the relationship of technologies and with our our society. And in many ways, I feel we also. Oh, we 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 need very we need to be creative and um and, and in terms of finding solutions looking for solutions but also i think we need also need to take a cross disciplinary approach and look at how what lessons we have used in the past we have learned in the past and what tools we have we have we have as human beings we we have we have um experience with and and these tools can also be applied to um to the use of ai for eco-friendly development thank you thank you so much for sharing your insights in terms of the need for multidisciplinary approach the need of um, ensuring that we have a very keen focus on understanding that this is not a new challenge it has a historical perspective and how we can begin to go about it to create more effective policies so at this juncture, if we don't have any questions or any reactions from the audience, I think because we're running a bit out of time, it will be time for us to conclude this fantastic conversation. And just listening to all the insights, I think the three key things that stand out for me is the need not to just um, not to just have like these conversations between people that are already practitioners in terms of creation of effective policies but to have like intergenerational conversations or intergenerational ownership of this particular policy creation, ensuring that there's effective consultancies from civil society, private sector, young people, academics, and people working on, you know, even the construction of these new technologies. I think the next um, key point that came out very strongly during the session is the need to have education as a foundational basis of this particular creation of effective policies whether that is in the funding of new research in terms of ensuring that we have it's an evidence-based process or that is educating the next generation of young people for them to be able to effectively interact with these new technologies. And I think that the, uh, what came out very strongly is that we need to have, um, like a, it needs to be collective action. It's not one particular player that's going to be able to create effective policies. It has to be collective action from every particular stakeholder and therefore having that multidisciplinary research or multidisciplinary collective action as we had from this particular session from the private sector, civil society, academics. So I think those are the three key issues that came out from this particular session. I think it's been fantastic for me to moderate and to listen in on all the amazing work that our panelists, our respondents are doing and also from the two um, presentations that we had from Ingrid and uh, Lily that give very key, concrete and pragmatic recommendations on what we can do moving forward. So with that, um, I think it's been fantastic moderating this from Nairobi, although it's literally 4 p.m., 4 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, but it's been amazing being with you. It's a very good start for my Sunday. And yeah, unfortunately I could not have my video on, but you all have that old picture of mine from 2020. That's how I looked during COVID. I was trying to smile through the pandemic. I don't know whether it worked, but it's been fantastic having all of you here. And thank you for joining us from whatever part of the world that you're from. And yeah, I hope that all of you have a fantastic uh, time during this particular you know, summit discussing emerging technologies, internet, and how the world can best respond to uh, our advances in technology for to progress you know, humanity and not to bring us back behind. So thank you and have a fantastic morning, evening from wherever you're from. Have a great day. Thank you all and enjoy IGF. Thank you. Thank you all, bye-bye.